This podcast contains discussion of child murder, brutality, and lying to yourself forever. Listener discretion is advised. On Saturday, March 1st, 2008, the Caffey family home in Emory, Texas was engulfed in flames. Terry Caffey, the father, had been shot five times and had amazingly escaped the burning home and crawled 500 yards to his neighbor's house where 911 was called. Firefighters found the burned remains of 38-year-old Penny Caffey, 13-year-old Matthew, and 8-year-old Tyler. Still missing was 16-year-old Aaron. Terry was immediately rushed to the hospital and into surgery. Once Terry was in recovery, a Raines County Sheriff told him that his only daughter was alive and well. Unfortunately, Terry's relief that Aaron was safe was short-lived. The Sheriff also told Terry that she was in custody for being involved in the murders. He was stunned. There was no way that his daughter had anything to do with this. However, Terry and the rest of the community were shocked to find that the evidence against Aaron was overwhelming. Oh my. <sighs> oh my. Uh, before we get going today, of course, we want to give a hey girl thanks to Kara, to Kara Miles. Hopefully one of those was correct. Beautiful either way. Jill Nicole Moore, Daisy Buchanan, and Brandy Scott, thank you for requesting this case. I didn't realize we had a literary icon in the building, Daisy Buchanan. Did I learn that in school? Possibly. I think you should have. Isn't she from The Great Gatsby? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, love it. But love thank your you guys. Style, girl. Yeah. Thanks so much. And also thank you to Madison for writing this up for us. Yes, thank you. All right. So we are going to jump into the case. We're going to talk about who were the Caffeys. So the Caffeys were a family of five who started their lives in Alba, Texas. Penny and Terry Caffey met when she was 21, and he was 24 at a revival meeting in Garland, Texas. And their faith is what brought them together and led them to start a family together. The couple was incredibly excited when Penny gave birth to a baby girl, Erin Michelle Caffey, in July of 1991. Three years later, Erin became an older sister to Matthew Ryan Caffey, who was affectionately known as Bubba. And then five years after Matthew, came their third and final child, which was a son named Tyler Paul Caffey. And they felt like that was their complete family. The Caffeys were a conservative and faith-centered family. Both uh, Penny and Terry worked as ministers at Miracle Faith, which was a Baptist church. And Penny also played piano for the church. Tyler and Matthew played the guitar and the harmonica. And Aaron had a what everybody described as a beautiful singing voice. Um, she was so talented that the church's pastor once said that if he had a few more of her, he would have no problem filling the church on Sundays. This feels just, it's a small town, you know? Yeah. So maybe just not a lot of singing voices around. Maybe not. Um, I have a hard time personally wanting to give her any any credit. Yeah. I mean, I, I won't lie. Like, I did watch the Killer Women with Pierce Morgan, who I have my own issue with Pierce. Sometimes refer to him as Piss Aunt Pierce. Don't like him. Never have. Never okay. will. Yeah. Just don't don't enjoy him. Mm -hmm. However, they opened this with him asking Aaron to sing, I think it was Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. And... I feel uncomfortable when anybody, which is ironic because all I do is sing, like all I want to do is just sing songs all the time, but I felt uncomfortable because she sang more of it than I was prepared for and I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of want to kind of get through this. I don't know about acapella, Amazing Grace. And she doesn't have a terrible voice, don't get me wrong, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but she's no Sister Act 2 singing, my Jesus washed. Oh, okay, sure. Or, or the, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, all right. Yeah. Yeah. And also, she did a lot of bad stuff. So it's kind of hard to, you know, not saying that you can never come out of that. It just, you I are don't not know, your you worst know? mistake. However, her m worst mistake's pretty, pretty f bad. So pretty I'm just, bad. yeah, just having a little bit of a hard time like reconciling that 
in my soul, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. Terry and Penny were very protective of their children, especially of their only daughter. Erin was often described as sweet, but she was also uh, described as very naive and sheltered, which makes sense. I mean, she had been homeschooled, you know, for a while, but this was also a very small town. And, you know, when you're little, you only know, like, what your parents give you access to, essentially. Now, this was before the internet, really. Yeah. Like, the internet was around, but it was not a household thing in the 90s, of course. Like, not everybody had it. So, like, kids now know a lot more than... Well, you're able... We might necessarily want them to. Well, and, I mean, you're able to stream lots of things at, like, a moment's... Like, you can get anything, anytime, anywhere. Whereas, in this day and age, like, when we were growing up, it was, like, what your parents allowed you to see, but also what you were exposed to in your community. So, yeah. And if you were gonna, like download an unedited version of a song, it was going to take you 19 hours to get one song done. And by then, you're just like... And then if somebody tried to pick up the phone during that time, forget it. Start over. Like, That's what spring break and fall break are for, is exactly. completing your mix CD. You're going to know that shit when my mixtape drop. Yeah, I've got like four more songs I need to do, and that will take me the entirety of the week. So, yeah, she was pretty, you know, she just... She knew what she knew, whatever. So Erin started eighth grade at Reigns Junior High while her two younger brothers attended Reigns Elementary School. But that same year, Terry and Penny pulled all three of their children out of public school following an incident with Erin at her middle school. Another female student was rumored to have a crush on Erin and had supposedly kissed her in the hallway at school. Her parents considered this to be incredibly inappropriate and Terry said that his family was, quote, shocked by the culture of bisexuality. So they decided to homeschool all three children. Penny began teaching them a Bible-based curriculum at home. Um, So this is now making her even less, mm -hmm. uh, even more naive and sheltered because now she's not exposed to anything outside of the home or Bible-based Right. culture i don't know which right is word, just not the world that she's going to encounter as an adult and even as a young adult like you know and again that's their decision it's their kids so of course that's yeah. that's what they want to do for 13 year old aaron who had been diagnosed with adhd and had difficulty keeping up with her classmates her parents thought okay well she'll get more individual attention this way they thought it would benefit her educationally as well but in the social aspect Erin had been a very social child, and then she was then isolated to, like, just home and church. So, I mean, that, that was tough for her. When she turned 16 in July of 2007, she got her driver's license in an old Chevy pickup truck, and she was super excited to finally have some freedom. She started applying for jobs, and she ended up being hired to work part-time at a local Sonic as a car hop. Um, and this was one... I don't know... Like, I don't know who all has Sonics or whatever, but, like, back in the day when Sonic started, all the car hops wore roller skates. That's all they wore. And, you know, you have the stalls and whatever. And then after a while, that kind of went away. But there are some that still do the skates, which I remember being young and being like, that's where I want to work. I want to roller skate all day. I mean, it was really cool. cool. I could have probably done it back then on roller blades because roller skating has never been my ministry personally. I suck Mm -hmm. at it. There is a big difference for me personally. But I would have been like Monica at what was it called? Like the Moonshine Cafe or Moon Dance Cafe that she worked at where it was like, Oh, they put yeah, everybody on roller like skates skating and then... into everybody, yeah, <laughs> yes. or into everything, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Erin seemed to do well with it. She was a she was a roller skate car hop, and she did great. And I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming this is true for here, but like for us, after school, once I could drive, like we would go to the Sonic, we'd get a milkshake or whatever. Like kids hung out there a lot. Um, kids well, would and... just hang out at Sonic at night. Yes, and. I don't know if this is something that happens everywhere, but Sonic does have a happy hour. So we'd go and it was like half off drinks or something, you know, mm-hmm. so it's like or you wine. get like cheaper burgers on a certain. Yeah, they have like something every night. So plenty of people are coming here just to hang out. Kids her age are coming there to hang out and she's got boys flirting with her. And it's like 
a whole new experience for her because she's not been around other people for so long. Um, and her coworkers remembered her blushing as she told them about guys asking her for her phone number. So now she's being exposed to more people and, you know, different things or whatever. But people still described her as shy and sheltered and kind of like her being in Sonic was like her being introduced to the real world for the first time. So that summer, while she was working at Sonic, Aaron met 18-year-old Charlie Wilkinson when she went to take his order. And he recalled that the moment that she'd skated up to the window of his 1991 Ford Explorer, he felt an instant connection. He had just returned home from boot camp from the Texas National Guard and was planning to go on active duty after his senior year in high school. He had no run-ins with law enforcement, no significant disciplinary issues at school, He spent most of his free time hunting and fishing. Uh, Charlie's parents were divorced. He lived with his father, stepmother, and Steph and Hap's siblings. Step... (laughs) The Steph and Hap siblings. That's not even a word! So close, but... Yet so far. So far. Yeah. Yeah, that was a whoopsie there. Um, I'm assuming you guys know that what I meant was Step and Hap siblings. Yes, okay. He had never gotten in, like, really serious trouble, but people did describe him as being kind of hot-tempered and easily provoked. After first meeting Erin, Charlie returned time after time to Sonic to visit her. Shortly after Halloween, Charlie worked up the courage to ask Erin out, and she told her parents that she'd met someone that she really liked. They, of course, wanted to meet him before things went any further. So Terry recalled that his first meeting with Charlie did not go as he expected. When Charlie came over to their house, Terry greeted him by extending his hand and saying, you must be Charlie. And Charlie goes, yeah, and you are? You can assume I'm Mr. Kathy. That's what you can assume. Like, yeah. Uh, Where's your Mr. and Mrs.? Well, and for him to be in some branch of some sort of military, you would think that maybe... He would have a little bit of respect and learn that you just can't talk to elders and, you know what I mean? Like, Mm -mm, mm -mm. I know it's not that way everywhere, but definitely in the South, like this is in Texas. You don't meet your potential girlfriend's father and not immediately, yes, sir, nice to meet you. Or, you know, like you're going to do a sir, you're going to call him Mr. You're not going to call him Terry. That's no. Like, it's yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, here. Like, that's that's how you're raised. Well, I'll tell you this. So, I am 35 years old, and I have a neighbor that we've had since I since we were born. And mm-hmm. when I referenced his wife as her, just her first name, he was, he came back at me. He, it wasn't rude necessarily, but he was like, Miss blah, 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 Miss blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I got it. Okay. Even if I'm... 75 years old we're gonna call her miss so-and-so because Mm -hmm. uh okay like that i get it yeah i don't know how to do that i'll have people sometimes tell me like because i'll call them you know miss whatever and they're like you can just call me my first name you make me feel old and i'm like i'm not trying to make you feel old it's just i don't know how to not do that like that has been like beat into me pretty much but um so the intro didn't go like it wasn't like picture perfect Um, but Aaron was allowed to see Charlie as long as they followed her parents' rules. So she was not allowed to go out with Charlie alone. Um, however, of course, this did not stop them from seeing each other. So Charlie would spend a lot of time with Aaron at her house until he was forced to leave at Aaron's 9 p.m. curfew. And then after that, they would talk on the phone until her phone curfew at 10 o'clock on weekdays and 11 o'clock on weekends. Um, And then Charlie even started going to church with Aaron at Miracle Faith. And to everybody around who, like, saw them, it seemed like just this innocent puppy love. In December of 2007, Aaron asked her mom and dad if she could enroll in public school again. And her younger brothers had gone back to public school earlier that fall. And she'd been working and doing really well with that. And they were really impressed with how she was, like, handling everything. And they, um, 
they let her go back. So she's now a freshman at high school. Um, Charlie also attended the high school and he was a senior at that time, which like, oh my gosh, when, when you're a freshman, if a senior even talks to you. Mm-hmm. So now they can spend more time together, right? Because they can see each other at school and all of that. And then Terry was finally allowing Charlie to take Aaron out as long as he had her home by 9.30 p.m. So now they can go to friends' houses. They can be alone, um, all of those things. That also opened up the door for them to start having sex. I'm sure that Terry would not have liked that. No. He wasn't like, all right, y'all go have sex now. <laughs> like, you know, she's 16 years old. But um, but they're kids, of course. That's what they were doing. So Charlie is driving one day. He gets pulled over. I'm sorry. He doesn't get pulled over. He just did pull over. I don't know why I threw a police officer into the situation. No, that's not even so, it. Are you high? But hey, Torella, <laughs> did you realize it's like to pull over and pull over like a sweater? It works the same way. I know. Different. Yeah. Yeah, so he just pulled over himself. He pulled himself over, Be- yes. Yeah, because then what he did is he got down on one knee and he gives Aaron his grandmother's engagement ring and they used it, like, as a promise ring. It wasn't, like, an actual, like... I mean, but to a kid that young, I remember I had a friend who had gotten a promise ring from her boyfriend and I was like, oh, I want one of those. Like, that means getting married. <laughs> but also, the, like... I don't know. I would have, if if it had happened to me in high school, gotten a promise ring, didn't. But if it did, I would have expected, like, a mood ring or something. Your grandmother's engagement ring? Like, that's kind of a legit engagement ring. I know. Yeah. That, that's, that's an engagement ring. Yeah. I mean, of course, they're young, so they're calling it a promise ring. Um, of course, Erin's over the moon, right? Like, she's super excited. Um, but she didn't really, it's not like she came home and was like, mom and dad, he gave me a promise ring. Like Penny just noticed her wearing it and was like, hey girl, what's that? Like, why, where did this ring come from? And so she told them what had happened and they were like, you have to give this back. Like, you're not ready for that. Terry talked to Charlie about it. He was like, look, she's only 16 years old. Like, that's it. This is not the right time for that. My daughter is too good for you. Um, and he felt that if Charlie was showing him so little respect, how was he treating Aaron? And especially now that he's not around all the time when they're together, he just didn't, he didn't trust it. This is giving me such Dan in real life. You are a murderer of love. Like, remember the middle daughter? She was like, so in love with her boyfriend and he was like you don't know what love is like you're Uh, however uh old 16 15 something like that and she was like i love him though i love him i know i love him and anyway her big i i quoted it all the time but like you are a murderer of love and it's like that's aaron in this situation i feel like oh yeah for sure because from this point on terry and penny told Charlie that they were going to have to start limiting their time together. Because at th- at this point, they were, everybody described them as completely inseparable. They were together at all times. He was always at their house. If he wasn't at their house, they were on the phone or they were out together somewhere. Like it was, you know, he was everywhere that she was. And that is, that feels not healthy. You know, I'm sure no. as a parent, you're like, I don't, this is too much. Like you need to have that healthy... You still need to see other, like, have you friends, do family things, like... But you don't even know who you are in at this stage of life. I'm not saying yeah. that it, it hasn't worked before and it can't work, but you don't know who you are. You don't know what you want out of life or out of a relationship. So you need to play the field. You need to find other people to spend time with and date around and see, like, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, yeah... yeah. And this is such an impressionable age. I mean, she's only 16 years old. And he's older. He's older. And she's going to, like you said, alluded to, she's going to make herself, the person she's going to develop into is going to be the person that he wants her to be, right? 
because this is the only relationship she's ever known. So if there's anything that's going on that is not appropriate, she has nothing to reference or compare that to. Mm -mm. And like, that's the age that I was when I got into a very abusive relationship. And but I didn't realize that it was abusive because I didn't have anything really to compare it to. And I just thought and we've heard this in uh, one of the cases that we covered. We've heard it more than once. But the woman who was in this abusive marriage said, I just thought that's what love was. I just thought that's what marriage was because I just didn't know. I just thought, well, this is how it is. So I need to deal with it. I need to figure it out. You know, it's on me to figure out how to deal with this because that's just what it is, you know. And like she's she's so young, that's what she's gonna think. And I mean, even him, like if it's the other way around, he's gonna you know, they're just both so young. It's just it's a lot. Um Aaron doesn't like this rule. She doesn't like limiting her time with Charlie. She started arguing with her parents, she was acting out, she threatened to run away. Um, they started fighting a lot. Um, about a lot of stuff, but everything kind of always circled back to Charlie. And one night, Penny found that Erin had snuck her cell phone into her room after curfew and was talking to Charlie. So she took Erin's phone and car keys away and told her that she was grounded. Grounded, And so this now takes away Charlie's weekly visits because she's grounded. Um, and at this point, People said that Erin seemed like she'd lost her light. They said she was no longer bubbly and bright. She seemed like she was doing everything half-heartedly. Uh, those at church who knew the Kathy said that they felt like something was wrong. They said that Erin kind of appeared distracted and uninterested. Penny also became withdrawn, constantly saying she needed to spend more time with her family. On February 27th, 2008, Penny's sister suggested she take a look at Charlie's MySpace profile. This is the straw that broke the camel's back because MySpace is the ultimate representation of who you are as a person. Back then, hell yeah, it was. I still can't believe Facebook hasn't jumped on the changing your page, like changing the appearance of your page, although nobody would care about that anymore. But um, being able to set a song that plays when you land on your profile and have glitter coming down in the background shut up right heart something like that um if you i still i'm still all in for a top eight that's all i want is a top eight Mm -hmm. i feel like some healthy um competition is never a bad thing you know if i'm mad at my husband i can move him down a little bit now he's got to work to get back up there i also saw somebody said instead of a top eight it's like the bottom eight like you are on your you're on thin ice here and you better watch yourself i like that yeah let's come out with one of our own that's like just negativity all the way around shade the shade (laughs) um all right so they look at his myspace page it's not good uh there are several comments about sex and alcohol use It, it, it alluded to him being sexually active him doing not necessarily drugs but definitely drinking and partying a lot and they're like that's not who i want my kid around right they um talk to aaron about this when she gets home from school and they're like he's just not the right person for you this is over you're gonna have to completely break things off with him and to their surprise she didn't argue with them and her best friend said that she talked to her about it and she was like you know, they're right. Like, this isn't right. Um, I've been wanting to break up with him for a while, but I just didn't know how. And so now she's almost, she seems almost relieved to use her parents as the reason why she has to break up with him. Mm -hmm. Um, And she promised, I'll break up with him. You're right. It's the right thing to do. I will make it happen. You go, girl. At 4.30 a.m. on Saturday, March 1st, 2008, the Raines County Sheriff's Office received a call from a local named Tommy Gaston. Tommy told the call taker that there had been a shooting at his neighbor's home and that the father had made his way home or made his way to their home and was severely injured. The father was Terry Caffey. The first deputy to arrive on scene could not believe what he saw. As he pulled down the winding road surrounded by trees that led to the cafes, the night, of course, at 4.30 a.m., still dark, 
but he got closer and he saw that the house was completely engulfed in flames and it looked to have been burning for quite a while. He immediately radio dispatched to have them send the fire department and he quickly made his way down to the Gaston home where the 911 call had come from, from uh, Tommy. Inside the home along with Tommy and his wife was Terry Caffey. He had been shot five times, once in the head, twice near his right shoulder and two times in his back. He was covered in blood and this is, it's a cold early morning in early March. Mm -hmm. He only had a t-shirt, pajama bottoms, and one sock on. And there was so much blood that it was really difficult to pinpoint where everything was coming from. He learned that Terry, after being shot, had crawled from his home to the Gastons, and this is about 500 yards. It took him almost an hour. He stumbled through brush. He fell into a creek, but he had made it. I know, the will to survive for this man. And before the ambulance arrived, Terry told the deputy that his family was gone and that Charlie Wilkinson had shot his family. Later, after being loaded into the ambulance, Terry told a detective that Charlie had broken into their home and shot everyone while they slept. He added that they'd recently told Aaron that she could no longer see him. It did not take long for the deputies to locate Charlie. They got to a double wide trailer where a male answered the door He told police that he didn't know if Charlie was there, but he was like, come on in, you can look around. And they found Charlie inside. He was laying on a mattress, he's wide awake. There was a gun on the floor beside him. And when asked, Charlie denied being involved in the attack, but he he did tell the, uh, the deputy that he had gotten drunk and passed out the night before. Another deputy went back inside the trailer to grab Charlie a shirt and his boots. And he noticed that both had blood spatter on them Charlie was then taken to the police station while firefighters continued to extinguish the flames at the Caffey house. And they ended up finding 13-year-old Matthew, 8-year-old Tyler, and their mother, 38-year-old Penny. So, Rains County deputies obtained a search warrant for the trailer where Charlie had been found. Chief Deputy Fisher looked around the living room and found a camouflage purse. Tell me you're from rural Texas without telling me you're from rural Texas. Oh, yeah. Uh, And a driver's license inside the purse belonged to Aaron Caffey. So he goes back into the room where they had found Charlie earlier. There were spent shell casings on the floor, a box of ammunition by the bed, and a used condom on the floor. Because all those things go right together, don't they? Um, Do you not have a garbage can in this entire trailer, dude? Well, if, if you saw pictures of the room. It's pretty bad. Um... So, there's, like, this giant pile of, like, clothes and blankets. Like, giant. And something moves in it. And he lifts the blanket up, and there's Aaron. Underneath this pile of crap. So, she is wearing pajamas and sitting in the fetal position with her back to the wall. And at first, I mean, he assumes this is Aaron, but it's... She's small and blonde. But he asks her name, she says Aaron. And he asked how she'd gotten there, and she looked very confused. She said she didn't know how she'd gotten where she is. She didn't know where she was. Um, He thought that maybe she was under the influence of something when he was talking to her at first. He asked her what happened, and her only reply was fire. And she's speaking in a very, like, meek, mild... um, just real quiet voice and like not getting um she definitely seemed like maybe she'd been drugged or something like it it seemed like something was going on so they take her uh to the hospital in an ambulance detectives were quick to interview the remaining Kathy child and Aaron still seemed confused continuing to say that she was only 14 years old she told officers that she had woken up in a house full of smoke that there were two men with swords that were dressed in black. They told her to get on the floor. And then she had, she's like, that's the last thing she remembers. She doesn't know how she got to the trailer, but she did recall drinking something that she'd been offered while she was there. Um, She didn't seem to show much emotion. She ended the conversation by telling the detectives, they're coming after me. And they were shocked that she was even still alive and 
let alone unharmed after what had happened to her entire family. So Terry is recovering in a hospital bed at this point, but he would later give a pretty detailed account of what he remembered from the night of the attack. He'd come home that Saturday night around midnight. He had just gotten off a 14 hour work shift. He um, had a quick dinner, then he goes to bed. Around 3 a.m., the door of the master bedroom slams open. And at first he thought it was maybe one of the boys who had had a nightmare, but then he realized very quickly that something was wrong. And that's when the gunfire starts. He tried to protect Penny, which caused him to be shot in the arm and the face, and he falls out of bed. He then loses consciousness. When Terry awoke, he could hear lots of noise and two voices. Someone kicked him in the foot, and he cannot feel the entire right side of his body. Then suddenly he remembered that his kids are still in the house. He heard footsteps on the stairs, and he tries to pull himself up. He then hears his oldest son cry, quote, Charlie, why are you doing this? Terry immediately knew that Charlie was there to get revenge, and he hears his son cry out again, no, Charlie, no. Then more gunshots. Terry falls back on the floor, and he goes unconscious again. When he woke up, his bedroom was in flames, and he finally pulls himself up. He sees his wife. She was beyond help. She had been nearly decapitated with a samurai type of sword that the other man, so Charlie and then there's another person there, had brought with him. And Terry knew that he had to get help. He was able to climb through the bedroom window, and then he crawled the 500 yards to his neighbor's home. And this is, I I cannot believe that he was able to do this. I mean, shot it's five times incredible. in the head. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's in and out of consciousness. He can't feel half of his body, but he makes it. Yeah. Because he uh, he's trying to get help, but he knows that his entire family was very likely already dead. It reminds me a little bit of the Wichita Massacre, because remember the one survivor, she saw somebody's uh, lights that had been still on. Yes. Um, And he saw the porch light of his neighbor. And that was his like, if I can just get to that light, if I can just get to that light. Oh, so sad and like incredible, but in such a tragic way. Oh, my gosh. Like what the human body can do. Um. And he did say, too, that, like, at that time, like, he he knew that his wife was dead. He knew that his family wasn't going to make it. But he also had this feeling in his mind that, like, if I can just get there, maybe we can get them help. Maybe we can fix this. And it's just so sad. I know. Um. All right. So Charlie is being interviewed, and it literally didn't take him very long to break. They told him he'd been identified by a victim who'd survived the attack. And he, of course, had no idea that that was even a possibility. So after that, he told detectives that Aaron had called him the day before and was livid that her parents told her that they couldn't see each other. And she told Charlie she wanted them dead. And he was like, or we could just run away together. There is another option yeah. here. And then we can come back after you turn 18. They can't do anything after you turn 18. And she's like, no, they will come and find us. That will not work. You, they have to die. Charlie said that around 1.30 a.m. on Saturday morning, he and his friend Charles Wade went to the cafe home. Charlie had offered to pay Wade $2,000 if he helped with the murders. $2,000 to kill an entire family. Now, I understand that when you're 18, two grand sounds like... A ton of money. Oh, sure. Like, well, I'll never have to work again. I've got two grand. <laughs> yeah. To kill an entire family... And then yeah. spend the rest of your natural born life in prison. I'm sorry yeah, if I'm giving sorry, it away, dude. but you're going to get caught like you just will. Because like, even if you don't think anybody survived, who had a motive? I mean, come on. So like, you're going to get connected to this. And the detectives, when they were interviewing Charlie and he said, yeah, I asked my friend, you know, hey, will you do this with me? He they were like, well, what do you say? And he was like, he just said, okay. They were like, did he ask any questions? Not really. He just said, okay, cool. I'm <laughs> so, like, I'm appalled. Like, how, how did we, how, how, and also, but why, and how? Because I'm telling you right now, I've never been propositioned in this way. Thank the good Lord in heaven. Thank Dolly Parton. Thank it all. If I had ever or am ever going to be propositioned, hey, will you help me uh, murder some people? The answer, of course, is 
give me a second. I need to make a quick phone call. It has nothing to do with what you're talking about, though. Um, and then another answer after that is f- no, though. Like, exactly. absolutely not. Like, what is happening? I just don't understand it. Like, and it's just like, no questions asked. Like, okay. And then, and then they were like, oh, also you can get $2,000 because Aaron says her parents have $2,000 in a lockbox in their house. And he's like, Psh, done, fine. Um, Icing on the cake, right? Exactly. That's not the only other person involved. So then Wade asks his girlfriend, Bobby Johnson, to be the getaway driver. And she says, oh, Okay. He said that they almost turned around when they get to the house and they hear the Caffey family's dog barking loudly. But Aaron called Charlie to tell him that she would keep the dog quiet. Don't worry about it. The group picked up Aaron at the end of her driveway and they drove around for about an hour talking about what they were going to do. And Charlie claimed that he told Aaron several times again, look, we can just run away. But again, she said, no, they've got to be dead. They've got to be dead. Um, she insisted, according to Charlie, that they would need to kill her brothers too. And this was because they picked on her and she didn't want them to be left in foster care either. That wouldn't be fair to them. So they go back to Aaron's house with the plan that Charlie would kill Terry and Penny and that Charles Wade would kill her two brothers. Charlie even told detectives that he had no conscience and killed them because he thought he was in love. And he said that Aaron and Bobby stayed in the car while the boys went inside. Charlie first entered Terry and Penny's room, firing at them until the gun jam. Wade fixed the gun. Charlie fired a few more shots. They left the room, but then Charlie came back in and cut Penny's throat. Almost, almost decapitating her. This was a really big sword like scary i don't know i guess i'm not really sure the different types of if there are different types of samurai swords but it looks like i don't know i've seen it um there's somebody on youtube i think that has this type of sword that's like hung up on a wall it looks almost like zelda-esque to me or something do you know what i mean like like a katana is that uh the right word for it no i don't know i know know that um well you didn't watch walking dead did you no i did not i mean nothing against it i just never watched it yeah michonne in the like later ish seasons i think it's still going i don't know but like we watched for a time and now we're done with it but michonne the character she carried two katana swords oh sure okay which andrew and i have decided is honestly the best way to go in a zombie apocalypse i mean you're gonna want guns too but they're loud they draw the herds in so if you've got the sword you're just boom 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 no noise understandable yes i get that completely in the that's walking most dead- of my sword knowledge though is walking dead <laughs> in the walking dead excuse me side note are they fast or slow zombies slow they're not fast okay because sometimes they're yeah. fast, and I thought, you know, I'm just... Yeah, and some things they are not that, okay. you know, they're slow. Um, Yeah, they, like, he goes back in, and like you said, nearly decapitates her for whatever reason. I'm not really... That's so... That is such a personal and vengeful... You know what I mean? Like, that... He had to have really, really hated her, I feel like, to have done uh-huh. that, to go that much overkill and overboard. Right. Exactly. And this is so sad. I mean, this is, we've discussed it a little bit, but um, just extra trigger warning because this is where the children are attacked. They heard the gunfire and they went and locked themselves in Aaron's room. That almost breaks my heart more than anything else because they felt safe with her. Mm -hmm. And it's on her orders that they are killed. This is their older sister. Wade supposedly threatened to leave if Charlie didn't go upstairs to kill the boys. Charlie told the boys to come out of Aaron's room and go to their beds. Matthew tried to fight Charlie, and as he did, Wade from downstairs pointed his gun at Matthew and shot him in the face. Wade then came upstairs and found Tyler hiding in a closet, and he stabbed him to death. As Charlie recounted the murders of Matthew and Tyler, this was the only time he showed any emotion during his confession. After the two believed everyone in the house to be dead, he brought a pre-packed suitcase of Aaron's belongings out to the car. She was ready to go. Charlie and Wade got the lockbox out of Terry and Penny's room and then used their lighters to set fire to... They would. Li- they literally just like kind of walked through the house and like took a lighter and like, light that on fire, light that on fire, light that on fire. 
and they get back in the car and Charlie said that Aaron looked happy and she said, I'm glad that's over. Wade dropped Charlie and Aaron off at the trailer where the two had sex, remember used condom, was found on the floor. So they get back, her entire family has just been brutally murdered and she's in the mood for sex. Like celebrating what just happened and... Mm -hmm. Uh, Aaron, who was very likely shocked to learn that her father was still alive, was given a toxicology test. She showed no signs of impairment and like no signs of smoke inhalation. And remember, she told the detectives that when she woke up, her house was full of smoke. She didn't know what was going on. These people drag her out of this burning room. There's no smoke on her clothes. There's no smoke in her lungs. The she would have smelled like smoke. Yeah. And your hair picks that up, like, uh -huh. big time. If I go to a bonfire, I smell like a country ham for a week, no matter how many times I wash my hair. Like, absolutely. She's got no smoke anywhere on her, like, none of it. And so her story is completely unraveling. I mean, that in and of itself is like, no, you didn't. Just, no, you didn't. So they find Bobby Johnson at the restaurant where she worked, and she initially denied any involvement until she found out that the police had already spoken to Charlie. Wade was also taken into custody. He showed absolutely no remorse during his account of murdering Tyler and Matthew. And he also added that as they'd driven away from the home that night, the house is on fire. Her family has been brutally murdered. I cannot stress that enough. Well, and she at this point thinks that every one of them, she has no idea that dead. her dad has survived, but. Right. And I don't know how much detail they would have given her in that moment if she had known anything about the sword, but she obviously saw them bring it back with them and like, or leave with it. I don't know. But anyway, Wade's testimony is that as they were pulling away in the car, she said, holy sh**, that was awesome. I am just so confused because I know that there is a statistic that one in 10 people is a sociopath. That's a lot of people to search. What is the statistic for a psychopath? I know sociopaths don't really have any, um, is it that they don't have any remorse? They don't, um, they, like, being caught in a lie does not bother them. It like, doesn't like embarrass that, right? them. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what are the odds that these four individuals in a tiny town in Texas have found each other? None of them care. Right. Because I do understand that, that they're young and the, um, you know, part of your brain that is going to think ahead about things, consequences, you know, executive functioning, all of those things, that's not fully developed your until you're Your prefrontal cortex, right? Yes. They're not, they're not fully developed. I understand that. But to be this cold and, ca and f like you said, four of them, no problem whatsoever with any of this. It's astounding to me that not one of them really seemed to feel anything outside of what ha is ha going to happen to me after mm -mm. this. How many teenagers were involved in Seth Jackson's murder? Tell me about it. Exactly. I mean, it, that's scary. And, and like, that's something that... You know, there may be people out there who disagree with Penny and Terry's rules or parenting style or things like that. And that's for, you know, that's fine. You know, it's their family, what, whatever. But it certainly is important that you know who your kids are hanging out with and you know what kind of people they are. Because maybe one of these kids on their own, not all of this would have happened, but the four of them came together and said, yep, let's do it. Absolutely. Like, that's scary. Well, and uh, while I was researching, doing, you know, researching this case and seeing the rules that they had put in place before the MySpace thing happened, I was like, wow, she had it kind of made at 16, being able to, we couldn't do that, hang out till <laughs> 9 or 9.30, stay on the phone till 10 or 11. Like, that mm -mm, was yeah. not. Yeah, we, like... Once I started driving, we had to be home before dark. Mm -hmm. And that that didn't change with daylight savings time. I had to be home. I had to have you home and me home before dark in the summer, which would be eight or nine sometimes. But I also had to do that in the winter. So now we're looking at 4 or 4.30 p.m. or whatever. And sometimes just with the school and the buses or whatever, like we got in trouble a few times for not being home in time. And I'm like, 
I just couldn't get out of the parking lot. Like, I literally came straight here. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, yeah. You get to stay until 930 with your boyfriend? With your boyfriend. Like, that's not, we didn't have that. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I mean, it's all perspective, whatever. I don't know. But I was just kind of like, man, she really, I don't, I don't see where the complaining came from. Like, you kind of had it made, girlfriend. No, and it seems like she just had this sense of entitlement of just like, well, this is what I want, so therefore I need to get it. I mean, and just the sheer ability that she had, even if you're mad at your parents, to order a hit on your two younger brothers, there's something. Because they picked on her? Broken in you. Oh, yeah. They're little boys. And they obviously felt like she was such a safe space. And that she could have protected them, and little did they know this was her word that this was happening. I mean, I hope to God, mm-hmm. I mean, we haven't heard any of this kind of stuff, but I hope to God that those boys had no idea that, that she, Aaron yeah. was behind this. I just really do. Everyone at the station, the police station, is ratting Aaron out at this point. And she was in the car with her grandparents who were taking her to see her father in the hospital. And she was escorted by the chief and deputy. And another officer called and informed them that they needed to take Erin into custody. And they could not believe it. Yeah, at this point, they still think she's a victim. They think that Charlie and his friends broke into the house, killed her family, and then kidnapped her. Mm -hmm. That he was just trying to get revenge. They had no idea that she had been part of it. Uh Uh-uh. Not even a little bit. So they pulled into a parking lot. They followed... uh, They were followed by the car with Aaron and her grandparents. And the officer told them that she was arresting Aaron in connection with the murders. Aaron's grandmother is hysterical at this point. And Aaron is telling her, I had nothing to do with it. I promise it was not me. I don't know what they're talking about. I had absolutely nothing to do with it. So because she was a minor, Aaron had to appear before a justice of the peace before being questioned. She declined to speak with officers, but she did agree to a written statement. Her statement was in line with what she told officers when she was initially taken to the hospital that she had absolutely nothing to do with the attacks. 16-year-old Aaron, 19-year-old Charlie, 20-year-old Wade, and 18-year-old Bobby were all charged with three counts of capital murder. Their bond was set at $1.5 million each. When Chief Deputy finally broke the news to Terry that his daughter was heavily involved in the attack. Of course, he was absolutely heartbroken. And there is audio of this and it is hard to It's so sad. Hear. Yeah. Because he says, I don't want a lot of details, but how much was she involved? Like how deep was her involvement? And the officer just goes, I think, what did he it say? It was She's, great. It was... It was great. Her involvement was great. And Terry, oh my gosh, it's heartbreaking to hear. Mm-hmm. He just collapses into sobs. Because I think that you can hear in that moment his heart actually breaking. <sighs> and he is just, I mean, sobbing and sobbing. And they're trying to consult as much as can be. They are trying to console him, but they tell him that Aaron is in custody. And of course, Terry's like, how could my sweet daughter have been responsible for planning the murders of of him, attempted murder of him? Because if she had it her way, he attempted murder is murder with a whoopsie. Mm -hmm. And then his wife and his two boys. So as Aaron remained incarcerated, Terry attended the funerals of Penny, Matthew, and Tyler. And he stayed with his sister for quite some time. He didn't have a house to go back to. Unsurprisingly, Terry became significantly depressed. And again, I mean, it's like, on one hand, I mean, I am in awe of the fact that he survived this. And you think, like, in a lot of ways, how lucky. But at the same time, that's the ripple effect that we have talked about time and time again. This is not something that is easily reconcilable. Mm-mm. Or and now he's process. been given a life sentence. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's been given a life sentence, too, of losing his family of having to reconcile that his daughter planned this like of all these things well and i'm sure it goes from i can't imagine the roller coaster of emotion he was feeling with at first being like oh my god thank god aaron's fine i I have someone left and now she's gone because she's now in prison or in jail and yeah it's just oh it's so sad and he made the decision that he wanted to end his life 
He considered going to the remains of his family's home and shooting himself, but he decided that there had already too been too much bloodshed. Terry then decided that he'd take all of the pain pills he'd been given, a bottle of Jim Beam, put a hose in the tailpipe of his truck, and run it through the window until he fell asleep. But he goes back to the property, and he looks at the rubble and ashes that are what's left of his family's home. And he started crying, and he's asking God why God took his family. Terry then, he said he looked down and saw a piece of paper in the rubble. It was burned all the way around it, all the edges. And it was from a book titled Blind Sight, which was about a man who lost his wife and two children in a car accident. The passage on the page that he read said, quote, I couldn't understand why you would take my family and leave me behind to struggle along without them. I may never totally understand that part of it, but I do know that you are sovereign. You are in control. And Terry realized that he was still alive for a reason, and he decided that he needed to heal. So he ends up buying an, a used RV. He parked it on the land where his house once stood. Despite everything that had happened to him and everything that he has learned, he actually did make the trip twice a week to visit Aaron in jail. That's incredible. And I have definitely heard some people... I mean, you can have whatever opinion you want to about all of this, but the state prosecutor, Lisa Tanner, she had said, she was like, however he needed, however, whatever he has got to do to get through it, mm -hmm. I don't fault him for any of that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and he, I would like to think that I could, you know, forgive anybody um, you just obviously don't know till you're in a situation, but to see him now, I mean, obviously he, ne he would never have wanted any of it to happen, but he is alive and he is, uh, vibrant and he is healthy. You know, he just, he's not lugging around that 5,000 pound weight of, hate and revenge and anger and you know all those things so um i mean it's it's incredible so now we're gonna get to the trials the state prosecutor lisa tanner that you mentioned said that she initially believed aaron's story and that she was very very convincing but everything in her story was pointing directly to it being a lie so Bobby told investigators that she'd heard Aaron tell Charlie that night to get rid of her parents, that she was tired of being beaten. This matches Charlie's and Wade's account of the night, and they've got all of them separated. They didn't really, like, they didn't know the other had been arrested and then have time to get together and, you know, work out a story or whatever. You know, we've never heard any evidence of Aaron being physically abused in her home. But how many times have we heard this? I mean, this is beer-flavored nipples all over again, right? Like, mm -hmm. it it seems like kind of a common thing for a female mastermind to do is tell the guy that is in love with her that I'm being, you know, this, that, or the other, and now you've got to save me. And for whatever reason, this guy and his friends are like, yeah, they they should die for that. Like, anyway. Um, Lisa Tanner said that the phone records are what truly convinced her, though. Between 11.46 p.m. and 12.48 a.m. on the night of the murders, Aaron called Charlie six times from her house. Between 1.22 a.m. and 1.58, she called him seven more times. And this corroborated Charlie's account that Aaron had called several times to ask them where they were, to tell them to come back, to tell them what she was doing with the dog. Okay, he's quiet. You can come back. Like, all of those things. There were witnesses who recalled hearing Erin talk about wanting to murder her family. Charlie said that while in school, she'd bring it up once or twice a day. In mid-February, another student allegedly heard Erin tell Charlie that killing her parents was the only way they could be together. Charlie apparently told several friends that he was going to kill Erin's parents. So many just, people. So sad, yeah. It's just so sad. I mean, they, they literally were just like kind of screaming it from the rooftops. He did tell another friend that he wished they could just run away or that, okay, well, maybe if Aaron gets pregnant, then they'd have to accept me. You know, they'd let us get married or something like that. Aaron told him she was too young to have a baby and that as long as her parents were alive, they couldn't be together. This is the only option, right? And those who knew the couple said that Aaron had a hold over Charlie and that he would do whatever she asked. 
One of the most damning pieces of evidence against Aaron was found when her ex-boyfriend came forward. Michael Washburn testified that he dated Aaron before she'd met Charlie, and he said that she told him she was going to hire someone to kill her parents because every time she got a new boyfriend that she really liked, her parents would make her break up with them. Okay, Aaron, I don't, I don't know, you know, why we have to say this out loud, but your boyfriend when you're 15 is not the end all be all of your life. Like, well, and it's so, it's, it's such a pattern for her. It's like, it seems like every guy that she came in contact with when she was that age, every one of them, it's like, this is the end of the world if this I can't be the with one. them. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Soul and that, mate, I mean, it's, love of my life. it's immature. It's very immature. And she is very young. I mean, it's just evidence of the science that our brains are not fully developed then. How many things happen in high school that you think you are never going to recover from? Like, I remember one time somebody told me I had a mustache. Oh, so I yeah. waxed my upper lip. My skin was so sensitive that I had a red line here for like a week. And it was a bad red line. And I like tried to cover it with makeup. But I put so much makeup on and then the powder and I caked it on and then it got dry. It was just more noticeable. It was a whole thing. And I thought, this is it. Nobody will ever forget this. And I guarantee you, anybody we went to high school with, if I asked them, do you remember that day, that week that I waxed my upper lip at home and it went wrong? People would be like, no, no, I don't remember that. Like, but I literally thought this is the end of my world. I can't go to school like this. I have to literally have to, I have to homeschool now. This is it. Like, this is the end of it. <laughs> yes. Like, it was the most important thing to me. High school is like the training wheels for the bicycle of real life. Initially, Terry wanted the state prosecutor to pursue the death penalty for both Charlie Wilkinson and Charles Wade. He could not understand how this person who he'd let eat at his table with him and his family could have come in and done this. But as the sentencing hearings approached, Terry ends up writing a letter to the Raines County District Attorney, writing that he wanted Charlie and Wade to be spared the death penalty and for them to have the chance for remorse. And he wrote, killing them is not going to bring his family back, and that enough people have died. The two men were offered a plea deal, which they both accepted. Charlie, Wilkinson, and Charles Wade each pled guilty to three counts of capital murder. They were both sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Bobby Johnson, who'd been named as an accomplice who did not use a weapon, was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Terry urged the prosecutors to give Aaron a lesser sentence, wanting his daughter to have something to live for. I don't know what I would do in this situation because I love my children more than anything. I don't know. I'd probably do the same thing. I mean, I just, I don't know. You know, it's just, that's that's gotta be so hard. But as an outsider looking in and knowing that she orchestrated this, and that if she'd found somebody else to do it before, she would have done it then. And just the fact that she was willing to kill her brothers, yeah. she never asked for them to be spared. Mm -mm. She didn't want to have to deal with them after. And plus, they pissed her off anyway. So they should die. I just, I don't know. I have a hard time with that. But I certainly don't fault him. You know? Oh, no, this no, no, is no. His no. Healing. Yes. But it's just, it's hard, you know. She accepted a plea deal of two life sentences to be served concurrently, plus 25 years. So with good behavior, she could get parole at the age of 59. Now, you guys. Erin still says she has nothing to do with the murders. She, in the Pierce Morgan thing, she, she admits to a point. You know, because he says, do you admit that or concede or whatever. I don't remember exactly what word he used, but you had the power to call this off and you didn't. And if not for you, this wouldn't have happened, right? And she's like, well, yeah, yeah. And he said, like, what do you, what do you feel sorry for? Or what do you have remorse for? And she's like, oh, I'm, I'm working through that. You know, like, I, I'm still not really sure about that. I'm still working through what I'm actually responsible for. It's something I'm trying to figure out. And at this point, when they are interviewing her, she has been in jail for almost eight years at that point. So she has had seven plus years to have thought about it, mm -hmm. to have come to terms with it, to mm -hmm. have been honest with her own damn self. Mm -hmm. And so you might think, because how much time do you have? I can give you plenty of reasons why. 
if you need help, I can help you out with that, Aaron. Uh, yeah. She can't do it herself. So. No. And, like, she told her dad that the reason that she called Charlie so many times that night was trying to stop him. And that once he decided he was going to do this, there was no stopping him. And Pierce Morgan even asks her, well, everybody that was there that night said that you told them that the only way to get past this was that your family had to die. What do you say about that? Why would you say that to them then? And she immediately goes, you know, I've been in here a while and I've talked to a lot of other women here and all of them have told me, oh, yeah, at some point when I was a teenager, I said, I wish my parents were dead. Everybody just says that. And I just didn't know that he would take that and run with it, basically. You know what this says to me? And I don't know if this is going to, uh, who knows? I mean, she could, she's still got a lot of time left in there. Because at that point, I think what she was 24. So she's going to be in, if, I don't know if, if earlier, but at least until she's 69. That's a lot of time to hopefully come to terms with it and to come to grips with what she's done. But if she never does, that to me says you should not get out because you have no remorse. You yeah. are not taking accountability for anything that you have done because she's still no. playing the victim. Exactly. Exactly. And it's all his fault. And and at the time of this interview, Charlie was still saying that he loved Aaron. Mm-hmm. Like, he still loved her. And Pierce is like, well, do you still love him? And she's like, well, I forget. Uh, I, uh, I forgive him. And he's like, no, not what I'm asked, do you still love him? And she's like, well, no, not like that. Like. Because she got what she wanted, and that's done, right? And even a mental health professional who was appointed to evaluate Erin for her defense said, she's incredibly dangerous. She knew what she was doing. And just the added factor that she had her brothers killed, like, that is some, that's some sh- mm-hmm. I mean, I just don't understand. She'd even, like, she'd been voted most likely to succeed and most fun-loving at a church summer camp. But there's that dichotomy because law enforcement says she's incredibly manipulative. She's incredibly dangerous. She is completely devoid of remorse whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, even, like, Pierce Morgan asked her, what have you and your dad talked about when you do, you know, get out? Like, what you'll do that day and all that. And she's like... Yeah, me and my dad talk about that. Uh, the first thing I would do would be pay my respects at the at the graveyard. Well, and Pierce is like, what What do you think you'll say? And she's like, you know, the first time my dad went there, he really didn't have, he didn't have anything. Like, it was just kind of the overwhelming feeling and he really couldn't speak, which she said it'll probably be like that for her. But in when hearing that for me, I was like, two, two different reasons, though. Because for you... You have mm-hmm. nothing to say because you don't believe that you're sorry. Because you don't believe that you... I don't know. Is she buying her own bullshit? Or is she... I know. Is she perpetuating this lie so yeah. that... You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. But also, like, when you ask her questions like that, her response is always, well, somebody else said blah, 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 blah. And so... And my dad said he couldn't speak the first time, so I'll use that answer. That she's very mimicking social things because, you know, because she doesn't have that that feeling sociopath yeah that's what they do because she's she's just pulling on calling on what have i seen somebody else do in this situation or if she does not do that what i noticed and i think you will agree because we just talked about it but she dances around the question she won't exactly answer it no um there's a guy that i watch his youtube videos sometimes dr todd grande um he's a yeah mental health professional i'm not t- I, he might be a psychiatrist i get some of the things confused I think about you what they sent do. me yes you've yeah i've sent you one of his he did a video on her and i haven't watched it yet but i would i'm very interested to know what he says about he did one on casey anthony yes he's he's done he did one on the kid that we did um who killed colleen ritzer um chisholm I forget his first name. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. That kid Chisholm. Yeah. So I think that's when I first discovered him. But I saw that he had a video and I haven't watched it yet, but I'm interested to know. Um, Because just to still sit there and look her dad in the eye, because he still visits her all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And and to just be like, yeah, I didn't, my bad. I mean, I didn't, I didn't, it's not my fault. Well, she's very much playing it like, I wish I had never met Charlie because, you know, yeah, if I'd never met him, this wouldn't have happened. He's the one who took he, it into his own hands. He took something that 
I didn't mean anything by it. it was just, you know, a heat of the moment. Oh, I can't stand my parents. And then you took it and ran with it. Actually, exactly. no, you organized a hit on your entire family. But um, exactly. right. Yeah, because who knew where the two thousand dollars in the lockbox would have been? Who quiet quieted the dog? Exactly. Who let them in? Like, yeah. So Terry Caffey went on to become an ordained minister. He met a woman named Sonia Webb, who he grew close with. Uh, They ended up getting married, and Terry became a father again to her two sons. He now preaches about something he's very familiar with, which is forgiveness. He still visits Aaron once a month in a high-security prison in Gatesville, Texas. And again, she still says she's not the one who organized it. And again, I know that as an outsider looking in, this case makes you feel the feelings because you're like, absolutely not. Like, how could, you know, you you have the feelings because it's it's kind of um, it, me not being a parent. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. I just can't, I can't imagine it, knowing everything that you know. But I don't fault him. And I don't think anybody else should. Uh, and I hope, I'm very glad that he has found the forgiveness that he has and been able to live his life moving forward in this way because there was a point where he didn't feel like he wanted to be around anymore so i'm very glad for him but it is um it's shocking Mm mm-hmm yeah yeah it's funny how people on the internet think that they have a right to weigh in on the way that he processes this like well and 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 be like well well to like all these people who have said things like you know you shouldn't forgive her, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And me saying like, you shouldn't, um, be, you shouldn't have an opinion, like have an opinion all day long, but like, remember that he's still a person and this is still his family that we're talking about. So I just encourage you feel the feelings, but take a breath. Maybe don't, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and hopefully none of us ever have to find out what we would do in that situation. It's just tragic. Yeah. And it's just disappointing, but hopefully she's getting some kind of mental health treatment, therapy. We can only hope. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's it, you guys. Yeah, that's it. Thank you guys so very much for hanging out with us and listening to our episode. We love you, and we will hopefully catch you next time. Bye. Bye.